We all know by now why 1984 never ended up being like 1984. And that is of course because of good old Steve Jobs. Maybe George Orwell was completely wrong, or just a few decades off. I'll leave it up to you to decide. We also know that Big Blue managed to dominate the entire computer industry, at least for a little while. For this year's Marchintosh, I thought I'd bring out my really weird and messed up early Macs, and restore at least one of them. As you will soon find out, it's quite a bloody mess of Macs. Let's start with this one. According to the serial number, this is one of the original Macs from 1984. To be more specific, it's number 2663 made in week 47. That doesn't make much sense, because a few weeks earlier, the original Mac was rebadged to Macintosh 128. If we move to the back, the badge only says Macintosh, because, well, there weren't any other Macs, so there wasn't anything to add. Later Macs had a badge that said Macintosh 128, or 512, as we will see in a minute. And apparently someone left the diskette in the drive. I hope it has something fun on it. The interesting thing about this Mac is that it belongs to Harvard University. At least it did, until some chad snatched it on his way out. Presumably off to Wall Street. I kind of wish these Macs could talk, they probably have quite a bloody story to tell. Now that I think of it, they actually can talk. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. I guess we'll ask them later. If we can get them up and running, that is. There is also date scribbled here, and apparently it changed hands during Marchintosh in 1986. Let's move to the second Mac in a row. According to the serial number, this is a Mac 128 512. That doesn't make much sense either, because it's number 394, produced in week 24, in the same factory in Fremont. The thing is that the 128 and 512 came out much later in the year. So there weren't any 128 or 512 in week 24. And certainly no 128 slash 512. At the back it also has a plain Macintosh badge, just like an original Mac. Unfortunately someone has improved the airflow on this Mac. Both grills on its side are cut out. One of the grills on top is missing entirely, and the other one is crudely glued back on. Let's continue with the third weird Mac in a row. According to the serial number, this is one of the original Macs, produced in the same factory again, as number 752, but in week 51 of 1983. So this Mac is seriously early. I don't know when production started at Fremont, but this date can't be far off. However, at the back it says Macintosh 512. So what the heck is going on here? Let's move over to the last in a row. This one is going to be even harder to identify, because one of the numbers or letters is smeared, unfortunately. And at the back it says Macintosh 512. So, quite a bloody mess to sort out. I think we're going to have to look on the boards inside and the dates on the chips and try to figure these machines out. The two Macs in the middle came from the same seller, so one possibility here is that he managed to swap the back covers. But that still doesn't explain a Mac 128 512 made in week 25. And the other two Macs came from two different schools, so they don't have anything in common. Okay, I guess we'll start with a quick test. Although I am a bit reluctant, because when that Mac was standing, there is now some brownish crap. I don't know what it is, but it probably doesn't belong inside the Mac. But let's go ahead anyways. So I've connected power and turned the power switch on at the back. So now I can turn the power on on the extension cord. Okay, fingers crossed. Let's see what we're up against. 
Okay, we got a bong. So that's a good start. And we've got a question mark. Not a bad start at all. But I think we may have an issue with the diskette drive. Let me connect a mouse and a keyboard. Okay, let's try to turn the machine on while holding down the mouse button. Well, the diskette drive made a noise and then start ticking. So I'd say that the sketch driver is pretty stuck. Let's try to manually eject the diskette. That is pretty stuck. I'm pushing quite firmly. I think that screwdriver was slightly too thick. Let's try with this. Now that is pretty firmly stuck. Let's try with this one. I think you should be able to do this with a paper clip. And I'm using quite a lot more force than I could with a paper clip. Let's try to boot now when the diskette is halfway out. Well, it made a noise. Now let's try with the mouse button push down. I uh, know that doesn't help, so so that diskette is quite firmly stuck in that drive. Okay, let's take it apart and see what we will find inside. Before we do, I'd like to thank our sponsor PCBWay. Aside from making excellent PCBs, they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection molding. Check out their shared projects page, where you will find some really cool projects for your vintage PC. Get an instant quote now at PCBWay.com. By the way, thanks to PCB Way, I'm using a new microphone in this video. Thank you PCB Way for supporting this channel. And to take one of these apart, you need a very long screwdriver. I think it needs to be 11 centimeters, but you may want to check online. Because it has two screws recessed quite far down the machine at the back here. And the usual disclaimer applies, don't poke around inside CRT displays or power supplies. They may contain dangerous voltages. That being said, it also has two screws at the back here, which I have removed. And then there's a fifth screw hidden inside the battery compartment, right here. Uh, now we can take an old rusty screwdriver and just pry the case apart and completely ruin the value of your rare and expensive early Mac. A better way of doing this is to put these screws back in and then gently push on them. And that should push these two pieces apart. There is also a special tool that was available back in the day. But I found this method works quite well. So now we have a large gap between the two pieces. Uh, we should be able to just slide the front piece out. Now this machine is freshly tested, so we probably have some voltages present. And uh, this doesn't look too good. I can already see some heavy corrosion down here. That doesn't look too good. And I can see a lot more corrosion inside. And by the looks of it, something decided to die here and start to rot. Not sure what that is. Probably a big spider. So let's slide this all the way out and take a closer look. Yeah, this is pretty bad. That is one sick Mac. There is some heavy corrosion on the chassis. So this Mac is no quick fix for sure. So let's remove that power connector from the motherboard. And a ribbon cable for the diskette drive. And now we should be able to just slide the motherboard out. Or what's left of it. And now that I have seen the condition of this machine. I'm pretty surprised it did boot at all. And since it didn't discharge the tube, I'm going to be extra careful 
where the power is supplied to. Okay, I didn't think it could get more confusing than it already is, but it just did. Because this motherboard has one of the early ceramic CPUs, but on this edge here it says 512K. So that's not a combination I was expecting. We'll take a much closer look at that board on the bench. And I think we're in luck, because I can't see any corrosion on the motherboard. There is a tiny amount of corrosion here. Okay, and here it says 128K. So this board is for both machines. Uh, we'll take a closer look at those numbers in a minute. But as you can see, there's only some minor corrosion here. And the back looks clean. And the connectors also have some minor corrosion, but nothing we can't clean off. So this is one lucky Mac. Because check this out. That is some serious corrosion. And somehow that motherboard seems to have survived. So we're doing pretty good here. This could be cleaned off. And I'm going to be a bit more careful with the analog board. Than I would normally be, because those caps might not be discharged. Uh, then we need to remove this ground lead. And lastly we have this coil here that is grounded to the chassis here. And now I think that analog board is free, so let's try to remove it. And just look at all that corrosion. That is nasty. This Mac has been bleeding for a very long time. So it's about bloody time someone took care of it. And even the tube has started to corrode. Look at this corner here. I think we caught this one in the last minute. Another decade and this Mac would have been gone. And now we can remove the chassis from the front panel with just a couple of screws and one of the screws that holds the diskette drive in place is in the middle of all that crusty rust but I think we're lucky so it came off really easily and I think I know what happened to this machine but we will look together in a minute and this should be the last screw that holds the diskette drive in place. And I think the diskette drive was lucky too. It actually looks pretty damn clean. Aside from this crap here. I can't see any corrosion. Yeah, even when I look inside. It looks pretty clean. And we might as well get that drive out of its cage. Since it obviously needs repair. Uh, that cage obviously needs a lot of cleaning. Okay, so next I decided to take care of the metal chassis. Ideally I would use the sandblaster. But as you may know, my garage is now my studio. So the sandblaster equipment is in storage until I get more space. Instead I decided to bring out a polishing machine with a wire brush wheel. One option I didn't think of at the time was to try out some chemicals. So I'm going to order some and we'll try that in a future video on some projects for comparison. Anyways, the polishing machine worked out quite well, at least on all easily accessible corrosion. Then I used a much smaller wire brush wheel to remove the rust that was harder to reach. There was still some rust left, so I changed to a regular wire brush and got some more rust off the chassis. Next I used the round file to clean out all the round holes. And finally I finished it off with regular sandpaper in all the hard to reach corners. At this point the chassis looked pretty clean and nice enough to use again. 
but if we leave it like this, chances it will rust again, since it's now bare metal. So I decided to apply a coat of primer. And here is the final result. By the way, if you like this type of content, let me know with a thumbs up. And there are a few places on the chassis where the PCBs are grounded. So I mask them off with some sticky tape. And aside from those two spots, we also have one at the back here. And here is where the analog board grounds to the chassis. So you need to leave this space here without any paints, in case you're playing along. Uh, next up we need to remove that rust on the diskette drive cage. And I'm just going to use some sandpaper. So this, yeah, this seems to work quite well. And then we need to clean that tiny tube. And according to this label here, it's made by Clinton Taiwan Corporation. It has a bunch of stickers, but I can't make out a manufacturing date out of these numbers. So let's try to clean this mess off with a wire brush. Yeah, this works quite well. Well, it's a bit hard to reach. Let's try with something much smaller. Yeah, that's much better. There's no need to be too picky. But in case there is some battery juice, I think we're better off removing it. Okay, I'd say that's good enough. And by the way, if you know where that red gunk is, please let me know in the comments. I should probably reapply some of that stuff. And then we've got the dead spider here, of course. Well, that's clean enough for me. Okay, time for the archaeology part of the project. And it's quite clear what happened here. So this is the battery compartment. And this board stands on its side with this side up. So the battery juice went down this way here. Hopefully the camera picks it up. And it also went down this way and messed up the legs of the power switch. And then went down this way here to the chassis. I'll take some close-ups and insert them here. I have to say it's quite remarkable that this fuse is still working. But as we have seen, this is one lucky Mac. So the battery juice has not killed any components on its way to the chassis. And the hardcore fanboys have already noticed that this is an early board. Because of that flyback, the silk screen on the board tells us that this is a 630 one board. I think this might be the first revision of the analog board, but I couldn't confirm it. So if you know, please confirm or correct me. And it also says 1983 to 1984. Unfortunately, I can't read what presumably is the manufacturing date inside this white silk screen. But if we look at this LM324, it's dated week 28th of 1984. And this LS chip here is dated week 32, 1984. So I'd say we have a matching analog board. And look at this. Reefa cap. And it's cracked, of course. I wonder why it didn't blow up when we did the power on test. So let's have a look at the diskette drive. And it's the drive I was hoping for. So this is the early Sony model OA-D34V-22. And made in Japan, of course. And it's manufactured in September of 1984. So that matches our week 47 quite well too. And these buggers are for 400k discs only. Yeah, you heard that right. Not 1.4, just 0.4 megs on each disc. I don't think I have one of the 400k external drives, but I have a few of the 800k drives. I wonder if I can use them with this Mac too. Otherwise I'm gonna go insane swapping discs on this Mac. Let's take a look at that logic board. 
Okay, so if you can stop staring at that lovely ceramic chip. Apparently this is a 128-512 hybrid board. It's also marked 1983 to 1984. I can't find a date anywhere on the board. But I think these boards were released on October of 1984. So that corresponds well with our production date of week 47 too. And these ROMs are Rev A. I think it's the first revision of the ROMs for these Macs. So that's a match too. There are these white spots in the silk screen to mark the board with 128 or 512. But they are left unmarked. However, to the left here we have 16 Oki branded M3764 chips. So this logic board has 128k on board. I checked the dates on the various chips on the board. And they range from week 20 to 42 of 1984. So I'd say Harvard here is a complete and original Mac from week 47 of 1984. Well, I'm running out of time for this week. But this project is taking up my entire bench. So I'm going to continue recording part 2 tomorrow. In part 2 we are going to clean up and recap both boards and try to repair the diskette drive. If you want to see the next part feel free to click the bell icon below and set it to all. That way YouTube will make sure that you will get a notification when part 2 is available. Meanwhile the case will bake in peroxide and slowly regain its original grey colour. It's far from finished, but if the camera picks it up you can see that it has already improved significantly. And by next weekend it should look really nice again. As for the badging, I don't know what's going on here. Maybe I have the wrong information about when Apple switched to badging these Macs as 128 instead of the plain Macintosh badge. If you know how to date the case, please let me know. I had a look inside of course, but aside from the signatures of the Macintosh team, the date stamped inside is from 1982, and that's obviously not when this case was made. Two weeks ago I launched a Patreon page, so I would like to end this video by saying thank you to the very first patrons of this channel. And now is a good time to watch the previous video, where we repaired a new old stock Nabu PC, manufactured in the same year as this Mac. Thank you for watching and I will see you next week.